so independents, I think, are probably on average biologically different and their brain structure is going to be a little bit different. So I just have a brand new study that we looked at what's called dogmatism. And so that's cognitive rigidity. That's Dr. Jay Van Bevel of New York University, an expert on the neurological foundations of political partisanship. We found that conservatives were more dogmatic, but if you looked at the far left, those people were pretty dogmatic too. Not as dogmatic as the far right, but more dogmatic than moderates. And so it actually seems like open-mindedness to different things and not being rigid or dogmatic is something that moderates or independents tend to score higher on. Set your dogmatism aside and join us on The Purple Principle for a discussion with NYU neuroscientist Jay Van Bevel. I'm Robert Pease, your host here with Emily Cressetti, staff reporter. And Emily, you've actually more than dabbled in neuroscience yourself. That I did. For a college, Dartmouth has a pretty awesome neuroscience department. And since then, I have run across a bunch of Dr. Van Bevel's studies, including one indicating how our partisan political beliefs are, unfortunately, shaped more by emotion rather than logic. Why do our brains so love partisanship? How could they get less partisan? And what's up with that less dogmatic indie brain? We'll consult Dr. Van Bevel on these questions. But first, let's get inside his brain just a little bit in the first part of Emily's interview. Dr. Van Bevel, thank you so much for joining us. So your training and your research is in neuroscience. But then what made you choose to apply that to politics specifically? Was there a type of like aha moment when you realized partisanship needed to be studied through a neuroscientific lens? Yeah. So I did my PhD at the University of Toronto. So the story here starts with the fact that I'm Canadian and wasn't uh, really that interested in American politics at all. And suddenly in the year 2006, my uh, PhD advisor got recruited away to Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. And I moved with him. And at the time, I was really interested in just group identity, how easy it is to form groups and how once you form a group and adopt that identity, how it changes um, the way that you think about all kinds of things in the world. And then it was the lead up to the 2008 national presidential election in the U.S., And at the time, Ohio was the biggest swing state in the country. And so every presidential candidate and vice presidential candidates constantly came through Ohio over and over and over again. And, you know, the campus was swarmed with people trying to register voters. And I was obsessed with it. I became a total uh, U.S. political junkie, even though I couldn't vote. And coming from Canada, which is a little more of a a multi-party system, I'm wondering if that affected how you saw the American two-party system. Yeah. The interesting thing about that multi-party system is if you decide that you don't like the Liberal Party, you could vote for the new Democratic Party, and yet you still don't have to vote for a party you dislike. Whereas in the United States, it's very much if you don't like your party, it feels like the other party is going to win because it's a zero-sum game of two teams. And I've written about this in publications that I suspect that's part of why two-party systems are more susceptible to partisanship and polarization. The other thing I will say is that Canada is a really good case where the coronavirus didn't have to get polarized. And so even though, you know, Canadians, you know, you have a largely conservative party, a largely liberal party for the most part of the two largest parties. If you look at the rhetoric of their leaders from both parties, Neither of them is downplaying the uh, coronavirus. And so that's a really interesting case where, and again, Canada is very close. I have a lot of family in Canada. And you have real political debates in Canada, don't get me wrong. And many of them are similar to the United States. But this issue did not have to get polarized. That's interesting. We have so much in common with Canada geographically and culturally. But we responded to COVID so differently. Even election nights in a multi-party system must be really different. And what would be a failure to your party tonight? Either the Conservatives or the Liberals forming a majority, I think, because the next guy that comes in kicks everything out. So they're showing us with the ballot box. And I think these are highly, highly motivated 
voters. Well, the people of Quebec and Canada have uh, chosen a minority Aucun parliament tonight. No party will control the House of Commons. I can tell you who lost. It's just both the major parties. We, the pollster has been pretty dead on in this. Yeah. Yes. They're both going to finish with less than a third of the vote. That's never happened in our history as a country. And now there are, the next questions are going to be not, well, you know, does the party with the most seats get to govern, which Andrew... And it seems like partisanship was working overtime here in the U.S. during the COVID response. That is for sure. Here's more from Dr. Van Bavel on the topic of COVID. I live in New York City, which was the world's hotspot for COVID-19. So I've been living in the middle of it and also studying it. And there's a couple things that have happened. The first thing that happened is that Many, many, many polls showed that Democrats took COVID-19 more seriously than Republicans. Why did that happen? We don't know for sure, but there are many clues about their political leaders and members of the media that suggest that Republicans were getting signals that it wasn't a big problem. Donald Trump famously said that Democratic concerns about COVID-19, or he called them a Democratic hoax, thought they were overblown. He constantly underplayed the risk. Even to this date, uh, he doesn't wear a face mask. And we found that in counties that voted for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton in the last election, they were engaging in 16% less social distancing or physical distancing during a long period of time over several weeks. And we also found that this was correlated with uh, exposure to Fox News as opposed to CNN or MSNBC. So... This is where once you have a polarized electorate and hyperpartisanship, if you have leaders and elites that they trust telling them something, they will start to adopt it in their own beliefs and behaviors and it can have, you know, catastrophic consequences. Okay, but then what about science because this feels like proof that trust in science and like scientific evidence is being sacrificed to political loyalty. Yeah, so I will say this, that if you actually look at attitudes towards science and scientists, Republicans tend to be pro-science, but they've lost trust over time in universities and professors and other elite sources of, they consider them elites, expert sources of information. And so that's a problem. And I think a lot of it up until this point has been symbolic, but it starts to have consequences when you're looking at a pandemic. It has lethal consequences. Changing gears a bit, you are pretty active on social media in terms of sharing your research on the partisan brain. But could you talk a little bit about the research you've done on social media itself and the effects of social media? Yeah, uh, definitely. So a couple of years ago in the 2016 presidential election, I started to become aware in the United States of the spread of fake news and misinformation. And you can start to see some of these things come through my social media feeds on Facebook and Twitter. And I also was able to notice occasionally the dynamics that happen in politics happening among scientists. When we would disagree on something, um, people could become very entrenched in their views. They might even use like highly moralized language about, you know, some people were you know, just bad scientists and had an immoral approach to science. And so I started to get interested in not only what was happening in American politics around that time, but spreading misinformation and partisan conflict. The goal for me is, you know, not just understanding, but hopefully once you understand it, you can start to, you know, advise strategies for, you know, cooling the temperature in political debates, turning those discussions to focus on, you know, reason-based arguments or data or evidence. And... Out of this research, what would you say are some of the main psychological concepts that seem to be fundamental in this partisan behavior? So there's a few core concepts that really seem powerful for me in understanding what's going on. The first one is really simply that people have uh, prior understandings of what to expect because they're turned into a certain you know news station for for year after year and start to develop a theory of the world. And so those are called basically your priors. The other thing that seems really important is that in addition to having these prior understandings is that we use our brain to actively interpret the information that we receive. And when we're motivated to believe something, 
we will try to argue uh, in ways that provide evidence for what we want to believe and counter argue things that we don't want to believe. And that's called motivated reasoning. And so you have a set of prior beliefs. And then in real time, you're also engaging in motivated reasoning. And then the third thing that might be important here, uh, we believe, is that people, when they encounter things that they disagree with, cause a feeling of what's known as cognitive dissonance. And so basically, that's when you have a conflict internally. And it might be between something that you read versus something that you believed before you read that thing. And you have a decision. You either have to abandon your belief, your prior belief, or else you have to dismiss the new information that you read. And for most people, the notion of letting go of a belief system or a party identity that they've held really closely to who they are is horrifying. Because if you've been a party member of the Democrats or Republicans for 10 or 20 years, the notion that you're just going to abandon that after, you know, you have friends who are, you know, members of that party, you've posted signs on your lawn or stickers on your car, for you to completely abandon that is deeply threatening to a lot of people. So there's lots of incentives that people have psychologically to just simply ignore contradictory information. It's actually the easiest thing you can do in that situation. And that must be why we don't see much change in party registrations. Even as parties change candidates and platforms. But, you know, we've actually had some guests push back on the idea that polarization is increasing, like Mike Kaplan in the first comedy episode. It's interesting because one of the ways that things are being, uh, in my sort of anecdotal observations, being polarized is there might be some people that are like, hey, don't do that. And there might be some people that are like, even more like, we say whatever we want. So it's hard to say. I, definitely, if it is more polarized, perhaps part of it is that we know we have more data. We have more, more people are talking. I asked Dr. Van Bavel specifically about that point, and he mentioned that many Americans today won't even consider dating somebody if they're from the other party. Which is another great opportunity for independence. Let's hear more about the partisan dating divide. Yeah, so I would say that that's true and false at the same time. So basically, we are more partisan than we've been in a long, long time. And so that's well documented, and it's documented in many different ways, not just in terms of people believing different things, but in terms of people actively disliking the outgroup. There's research suggesting that people are less willing now to date somebody from the other party than they would be to date somebody from a different race, which was, you know, for the last hundred years, a major barrier for people. So that's where he's wrong. What he's right about is that we overestimate how polarized we are. So we're definitely more polarized. But at the same time, if, if you go to, around and you ask people how different they are from somebody in the other party, they tend to actually make vast overestimates of how different they are. They have bad stereotypes of the other group that actually aren't true and don't reflect the other group's true beliefs. And so that gets amplified in the media and you create these caricatures or cartoon versions of people from other parties. So like Fox News is particularly uh, notorious for this. They'll pull out like in a bad, you know, something happens on a campus that looks really bad and they act as if this is a common event, even if it's remarkably rare. That's true. Cable news is definitely a big factor, but social media plays a role too. And so what exactly happens in the brain when somebody clicks through social media? So social media, I spend way too much time on it, so... All the things that are going to come out of my mouth are not just from my research, but are from my own experiences, and I'm susceptible to them myself. For many young people, it's now the primary source of their political news. Research by Molly Crockett at Yale University has also found that it is uh, the primary source of moral outrage for people. And so we have a number of studies on this. This is spearheaded by my former student, Billy Brady. And we wanted to look at, you know, he was interested in moral emotions and it seemed obvious to him and to me that maybe that was the type of language people would use when they wanted something to go viral. They would express outrage or great joy if it was something morally virtuous. And so if you want your message to go viral, you can just load up with a bunch of language like that. But what we also found that was quite interesting was who was sharing it changed depending on if you had that moral emotional language in it. When people were using that moral emotional language in Twitter, it was more likely to go viral, as they say. But it was mainly only going viral among like-minded people. 
So liberals suddenly enter a liberal uh, chamber, an echo chamber of other liberals, and conservatives are suddenly talking to an echo chamber of other conservatives. It doesn't really cross over to people who are different than you. Well, then this this seems like this becomes a feedback loop. Yeah, yeah. So it cuts people off from one another. The other thing is that social media is an attention economy. So I read a statistic that the average person scrolls through 300 feet of social media newsfeed a day, the average social media user. So that means if you have your iPhone and it's six inches tall, every time you flick up to you know see more stuff on your Twitter feed or Facebook feed, that's six inches. So imagine doing that 600 times a day. And so what we found in, in lab experiments, this was uh, led by Anna Gantman, who's a professor at CUNY, we found that if you show those moral emotional words, they pop out more to people. And so if you want to get attention, you want to build a large set of followers, you want to promote yourself professionally or get people going to your blog to click on it or buy your book, that this is one way you can basically weaponize this language and then monetize it. So that's the economy of uh, social media that we've created and that now 3 billion of us spend time in every day. Uh, So the social media dragon rears its ugly head again. Breathing moral language fire. Doesn't look good, Emily, in terms of stemming partisanship. Our brains are tribal. We have this two-party system. And then social media inflames things even more. Yes, but wait, hold that pessimism. There are cases where societies do transcend partisanship. And the Black Lives Matter movement might be one of them. Here's Dr. Van Bavel on that. Yeah, so... One thing that it's important to understand when we're talking about partisanship and polarization is that there's all these other complexities. And one of them is race and demographics and age. And there's overwhelming evidence that the Black community votes Democrat and has for a long period of time. However, with the Black Lives Matter movement, there's been something really remarkable in that public attitudes towards that movement shifted dramatically in a way that almost never happens with political issues. So it's suddenly now becoming nonpartisan, where something like 85% of the public supports getting rid of the militarization of police forces or uh, banning choking among police officers. And so that is a really interesting case where you took something that is driven in part by a demographic group that tends to be democratic, and they've brought an issue to public awareness in a way that's had a sea change in public opinion, you know, getting 85% approval for something in a polarized country like this is really a remarkable achievement. So the shift from partisan to nonpartisan, is that a shift of, say, seeing common humanity? And then, like, therefore, somebody's in-group becomes all Americans rather than one of the parties? Yeah, I think that Humans have the capacity to empathize with other people. And I do think that there is a a broader awareness and understanding of racism and issues of systemic racism. I think a big issue now has been the videos, like the video of uh, uh, George Floyd. People can watch that and they can see what's happening to other human beings in a way that they couldn't have seen 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 years ago. And when they see it, when they see it happening in another human being who is uh, should never be treated like that, that activates the conscience for many Americans. And that changes the conversation and helps build consensus. So that was some of that basic empathy Dr. Abigail Marsh spoke of in the episode Heard from the Herd. Let's play some of that for those who've not heard that episode. I really think that contact hypothesis is really all what it comes down to. And it's one of the oldest theories in psychology, which is that just contact with people who are different from yourself, especially in a non-antagonistic setting, is a great way to heal these divides. And Dr. Marsh also said that independents might have higher cognitive abilities or higher tolerance towards dissonance, which is a key question that I asked in the final part of my interview with Dr. Van Bavel. Great. Let's hear that. Dissonance and all. So 35 to 40 percent of Americans are independent or unaffiliated voters, and that's a big portion of the country. 
And there seems to be a lot of research on the conservative versus liberal brain. But what about the independent brain? Yeah, so there are many studies looking at genetic and other biological influences on politics. So the genetic stuff, I think, is really compelling. And I remember the first time I heard about it, I was, I was shocked. It changed how I thought about politics. Basically, what they find is they look at twin studies and they can see what is your likelihood of having the same political preferences as a, a twin. What they find is that identical twins are dramatically more likely to have the same political preferences. And so what that says is that politics, our policy preferences and political preferences, are heavily shaped by our genes. In fact, if you took an identical twin and just, you know, from a Democratic family and, and separated them at birth and raised another one in a Republican family, uh, those twins would still be very likely to share the same politics. And so the reason why we often share our parents' political beliefs is not because we're absorbing the ideology that they're sharing at the dinner table conversation. It's because we actually share their genes. But as I said, that's only about 40 to 50% of your political preferences. That's interesting, which kind of explains why the nature versus nurture debate is never really settled. Because both are important. And here's more on that. The other half of the story is dictated by what your experiences are and your exposure to things. Um, it's dictated by who your friend group becomes. And so... It's not that we're born with a political brain, but we're born with an orientation towards worlds that attracts us towards certain types of parties and policies and leaders. One of my favorite studies on this was done uh, in London uh, by a set of neuroscientists and uh, the actor Colin Firth. And so Colin Firth speculated publicly that maybe liberals and conservatives have different brains. And he ended up working together with a team of world-class neuroscientists, and they scanned the structure of brains of a bunch of people who lived in London at the time. And they found that there were structural differences in gray matter volume. Um, so conservatives effectively had more gray matter volume density in their amygdala, and liberals had more gray matter volume density in their anterior cingulate cortex. It's not a clear, simple psychological story about what that means, and what it simply suggests is that there are differences in how our brains are wired that are correlated with our political preferences. What we don't know is whether this is a chicken or an egg. So it's possible that, you know, that's something that was in their brain structure when they were born and it attracted them to these political preferences. But of course, we do know that brain structure changes as you get experience and age. And I'll just say... We tried to run a couple versions of that study in New York on an American sample. What we found seemed to be accounting for those big differences was actually just people's attitudes towards the status quo and defending the system that they're in. Because you find out conservatives tend to care more about respect for authority and be more hierarchical than liberals. Liberals care about egalitarianism and flattening hierarchies. So we thought that might be one of the reasons we see those structural differences. But I'm just going to say that that's, that's speculative. Right. So that's the liberal versus conservative brain. But have you learned anything about the independent brain? Yeah. So the independent brain, I would love to say that it's radically different. But what we find is the independent brain is pretty much just in the middle. <laughs> so when we measure conservative and liberals, unfortunately, the way we end up talking about it is if those are two different groups. Liberals are a cluster over here and conservatives are a cluster over there. But in reality, it's actually a, a continuum and people fall all along that continuum. So someone, some people are far right conservatives, some people are just moderate conservatives. Then you have people who are kind of in the middle, you know, and they tend to gravitate less to political parties and maybe just define themselves as independent. So one last question, because we are a show primarily for independent and unaffiliated listeners, we ask every guest to show a bit of purple where... If you could name either a position or a person from each of the two major parties, and yes, we only have two, <laughs> um, that you respect or support in some way. Good question. Let me think. Um, so I'll give you a case of someone I respect. So right now, since we're talking about coronavirus, I really respect how Andrew Cuomo, our Democratic governor, has handled it. He, in the absence of federal leadership, he took control of a terrible, dangerous situation, took it seriously, 
And so I really respected how he handled it. And we're now enjoying the outcome of it. In terms of, uh, so I'd be a Democrat. In terms of Republican, so I lived in New York during Hurricane Sandy. And I remember that uh, I believe Barack Obama was uh, president. And the hurricane hit New York and New Jersey really hard. And I remember how much respect I had for Chris Christie at the time, how closely he worked with Obama, even though they were members of different parties, to try to deal with the emergency crisis on the ground. And I thought that was great. He put part, both of them put their party identity away and dealt with the needs of Americans who were in a, an incredible crisis. That's the type of, you know, one type of, one element I think that should be necessary for political leadership is people who understand that they need to put that aside at moments like that. Okay, never thought I'd be nostalgic for Hurricane Sandy, but a good point about crisis leadership. What do you think, though, is the main neuroscience takeaway from Dr. Van Bavel? That might depend on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. Or where your gray matter is concentrated? For optimists, he did point to Black Lives Matter, where empathy rose above partisanship. But for pessimists, he confirms many Americans are just hardwired to take opposing views. Which is inflamed by our two-party system and social media, but let's give Dr. Van Bavel the final word here. I'm not going to say that everybody who's, uh, you know, really into politics fits this psychology, but I've been reading a lot about cult psychology recently. And there are these really interesting cases where people believe in a cult, they're cult members, and they, you know, they give away all their possessions. Often they cut ties with their family members. And there's been a couple studies where they have looked at what happens when certain cults predict the end of the world. And they've been able to study, you know, what happens the day that the, that prediction doesn't come true. What you might expect is that cult members should update their beliefs. They should be like, oh my goodness, this cult was totally wrong. What was I thinking? I've got to rebuild my life and I've got to move, I've got to leave this cult. But that's not what happens. In fact, uh, a couple studies that have gone into these cults and looked at these cult members have found, if anything, the opposite happens. They immediately start to look for rationalizations. And so in that situation, they actually double down on this identity they have with this cult. And in one of these studies, they found that people actually started proselytizing more. They actually felt motivated to go tell the media that they had saved the world and try to convince other people to join the cult. And so there's a kernel of that psychology in human nature that applies to all kinds of identities we have, whether we're talking about politics and people you know, find something terrible about their favorite party or politician and they can't let go of it. That was our featured guest, Dr. Jay Van Bavel, Associate Professor of Neuroscience at NYU. You don't need to give away possessions to join the Purple Principle cult, but you do need to listen with an open mind, share us on social media, and ponder these questions. How did we get so partisan? How could we as a nation be less partisan? And can independent-minded Americans like you help bridge the divide? Join us next time as comedian and science podcaster Shane Moss weighs in on these questions and a few we didn't even ask. This whole quarantine has been like a psychedelic trip. And then all of these interesting cognitive biases are coming to the surface too. The environmentalists are going, we've been telling you that Mother Nature was going to have her revenge if we didn't watch out. And the evangelicals are like, see, this is, we said Jesus was going to come back. Everyone was right about this and everyone called it, but somehow no one saw it coming all at the same time. This is Robert Pease for the Purple Principle team. Emily Crisetti, staff reporter. Kevin A. Klein, audio engineer. Janice Murphy, marketing and outreach. Emily Holloway, research and fact-checking. Awesome music by Ryan Adair Rooney. There's more info, including show notes and sources, at purpleprinciple.com.